This video is brought to you in collaboration with wowhead.com. Hello everyone. Scenarius is probably one of the more well-known demigods, or as they're also called, wild gods of Azeroth. What are wild gods, you might ask? Well, the wild gods are primal manifestations of life and nature. Way back when, in a time where the Keepers had defeated the old gods and brought order to the planets, it was Keeper Freya who wandered the world. Ripping out the old god Yasharash, it had created a massive wound from which volatile arcane energy, the life essence of the titan spirit slumbering within, it lashed out across the world. The Keepers created the Well of Eternity to patch this wound, to which Keeper Freya, like I said, she wandered the world, searching for areas where the energies from the Well of Eternity had coalesced. These regions created optimal conditions for the development of new flora and fauna. She shaped immense enclaves of nature at these places of power, molded life of astounding diversity, seeding it around the world. The sites where Freya had done her work were located at the polar extremes of the world. This included regions that would later become known as Onguro Crater, Sholazar Basin and the Vale of Eternal Blossoms. The greatest creatures to emerge from these enclaves were the colossal animals known as the Wild Gods. Freya adored and cared for these majestic beings as if they were her very own children. She often wandered the physical world with the Wild Gods at her side, vibrant forests and grasslands blooming in their footsteps. Yet there was one place that she and the Wild Gods frequented more than any other a massive forest's peak called Mount Hyjal. It was on the slopes of Hyjal that Freya bound the spirits of her beloved wild gods to the Emerald Dream. What is the Emerald Dream, you might ask? Well, this is an ethereal realm of spirits and untamed nature that exists alongside the world of Azeroth. Some believe that Freya wove the Emerald Dream into being from absolutely nothing, while others, they claim that this strange place, it has always existed in some form, a dream born from Azeroth's slumbering world soul. It is said that Freya tapped into this realm and molded it as a way to commune with the nascent Titan. Whatever the truth might be, the spirits of the Wild Gods were now forever bound to the dream. Wild Gods like Aviana, the Mistress of Birds, Ursok and Ursul, the Colossal Bear Lords, Goldrin, the Great Wolf, and Malorn, the Honorable White Stag. Now the origin of Scenarius has never been explained by the wild god himself, but legends say that he was born from the union between Malorn and Alun. The legend, it states that into the brave hearts of her pure children, the Earth Mother placed the love for the hunt. For the creatures of the first dawn were savage and fierce. They hid from the Earth Mother, finding solace in the shadows and the wild places of the land. The Shuhalo hunted these beasts wherever they could be found and tamed them with the Earth Mother's blessing. One great spirit eluded them, however. Aparo, known as Malorn to the Night Elves, was a proud stag of snow-white fur. His antlers scraped the roof of the heavens and his mighty hooves stamped out the deep places in the world. The Shuhalo hunted Aparo to the corners of the dawning world and closed in to snare the proud stag. Seeking to escape, the great stag then leaped into the sky. Yet, as his escape seemed assured, his mighty antlers tangled in the stars which held him fast. Though he kicked and struggled, Aparo could not lose himself from the heavens. It was then that Musha found him as he chased her brother Anshi towards the dawn. Musha saw the mighty stag as he struggled and fell in love with him immediately. The clever moon made a bargain with the great stag. She would set him free from the snare of the stars if he would love her and end her loneliness. Musha loved Aparo and conceived a child by him. The child, a demigod, some would claim, it was born in the shadowed forest of the night. He would be called Cenarius and walk the starry path between the waking world and the kingdom of the heavens. We're still uncertain as to what exactly Elune is. Hopefully the next patch will give us a bit more information on that. And of course, this is a tale of legends. Who knows how Cenarius truly came to be? It's not even the craziest union that they have in a family tree either. From Cenarius were born three sons and one daughter. Lunara, a dryad mostly known as a hero within Heroes of the Storm. Remulus, keeper of the grove, who gave the brawl bear mantle his idol. Ordanus, that can be found guarding Ashenville. And then his oldest son, Zetar, whose spirit can be found within Marauden. His spirit ended up there because Princess Feradaras had been busy draining the lands now known as Desolace of Life. And Zetar, he showed up to investigate. Her stolen life energies, it had quite an effect on the keeper, and he quickly grew enchanted with her beauty. I mean, Obviously, who would have fallen in love with that beauty? She found Zetar beautiful as well, and despite knowing that this was against nature, and despite the warnings of Remulus, Zetar became Feradras' mate. 
And from their forbidden union, the Centaur were born. Centaur, who would quickly turn against their own father and murder him. So yeah, maybe the union between Aluna and Malorn isn't that crazy. Having a moon as your mother is amazing on its own. But Cenarius were lucky enough to also have a more physical, adoptive mother. The green dragon aspect Ysera, whose domain was the Emerald Dream. Unlike many of the other wild gods, Cenarius was more humanoid in appearance, and he also kept a closer connection to the creatures that evolved in the world of Azeroth. When the ancient Mogul Empire was at its height, an intelligent bovine race known as the Yongu, they roamed the grassy plains of central Kalimdor. These burly creatures lived in harmony with nature, following the guidance of the wise Cenarius. The majestic half-stag, draped in a cloak of flowers and vines, often walked among the nomadic Yongu, he taught these creatures the secrets of the wild, and he delighted in watching them flourish. Eventually, the Yongle grew wary of sharing hunting grounds with the nearby trolls, and they decided to seek new lands. Although their beloved demigod urged them to stay and make peace, they set out to go south. The emperor of the Mogu at the time, Xiang the Merciless, he found these Yongle, and he ordered his flesh shapers to capture these nomads, and transform them into even mightier and more intelligent servants, while at the same time tempering their more savage instincts. The Yongle would suffer under the tyranny of Mogu oppression for generations, until they found the strength to rise up alongside the other slaves to overthrow the cruel masters. Some of them decided to stay behind in the area, some of them moved further north, while others, they settled in the areas of central Kalimdor again, and they reunited with the ancient benefactor. Returning to their ancestor hunting grounds, it allowed them to rediscover their old traditions. Those who studied with Cenarius, they learned the druidic magic of the natural world, while others, they mastered the arts of wielding shamanic powers. You might remember seeing the Yongo still in Pandaria. We also had the Tonka in Northrend, and the ones that stuck with Cenarius, they would take the name Torren. But some of the trolls that pushed the Yongle to migrate to begin with, they found a way to the Well of Eternity, and under its influence, the Dark Trolls, they evolved into a race known as the Night Elves. The trees, flowers, and woodland creatures silently watched the Night Elves flourish, whispering news of them to the wild gods of Hyjal. Among them, Cenarius took a keen interest in these newcomers. The Night Elves would claim that he was the son of the Great White Stag Malorn and Haloon herself. Cenarius adored the Night Elves, and he believed that they had the potential to become great caretakers of nature. He befriended the fledgling race, and he taught them about the natural world. It was his hope that the Night Elves would strive to live in harmony with the wilds, and for many centuries they actually did. The Night Elves also honed their ties with the surrounding woodlands and the myriad inhabitants. Cenarius guided them when necessary, pleased by the wisdom and benevolence that thrummed in their hearts. But in time, many of the Night Elves yearned for a different life. Their minds were focused on unlocking the secrets of the well, focused on honing their magical arcane arts, and with the rise of the Queen of Zara, they would step further and further away from their roots. With growing unease, Cenarius watched as the Night Elf Empire expanded. Year by year, he became increasingly frustrated with the hubris and thoughtless actions of the sorceress Highborn. Their studies eventually led them to make a contact with Sargeras and the Legion, and a plan was formed to bring the Burning Legion into their world. For this, they would use the magical founder power to create a massive gateway for the Legion to come in. It was around this time, when a young night elf named Malfurion Stone Rage, he was walking the Emerald Dream, and he feared for what he sensed was going on at the palace. Under the tutelage of Cenarius, he had become the first mortal druid on Azeroth. Even his twin brother Illidan Storm Rage tried to follow in his footsteps, but the path of nature, it wasn't for him. Instead, he found his calling with the more traditional ways of magic. Tron the Whisperwind was their friend since childhood, but with age came more mature feelings. Both twins loved her very much, but ultimately, Tyrande would give her heart to Malfurion. Cenarius explained that what Malfurion saw in his visions, they could mean many things, no matter how they might look. Now, as we know, time would prove that his sense of dread was all too real, and he figured out what they were doing at the palace. Not everyone was down with the plans of the queen of scouting the world and reforming to perfection, though. Her image of perfection, so a night of resistance was formed. The Legion's numbers and powers were so great that they alone would not be enough. Even the highborn that stepped away from the queen and joined them in battle would not be enough. Even the other races, like Torren, Irvin and Furbox, even the dragons and all the other wild gods, were also called to the War of the Ancients. Who dares defile this ancient land? It took Cenarius quite some time to convince his brethren to join, but when they did, their battle was mighty. 
The forest trembled as these gargantuan beings marched down from the slopes of Hyjal. Each of the wild gods possessed strength and power unlike anything the demons had yet faced. With their aid, they might actually stand a chance against the might of the legion, but the cost was horrific. Thousands upon thousands of demons fell, but so too did many of Azeroth's mighty defenders. The legion's bloodletting warriors even overwhelmed a number of the wild gods. One by one, these primordial creatures succumbed to the poison black blades and fell powers wielded by the demons. With each death, the forest atop Hyjal shivered, and the winds howled in sorrow. With each death, Cenarius was pushed harder to compensate for those that they had lost. Such was his fury, that at last he became the prime focus of the Burning Legion's onslaught. The invisible hand of Archimonde guided the most powerful of their demons towards the Forest Lord. More and more, the fearsome warrior surrounded Malfurion's mentor, until even Cenaris' antlers could barely be seen. Then, just as it seemed that he too would fall, there was a flash of white. A gargantuan, four-legged form struck the swarm of demons head-on. A wreck several times more massive than that of the Forest Lord, it threw fiery warriors by the score from the faltering scenarios. Huge hooves crushed in hard skulls or caved in armor chests. Teeth snapped off limbs or ripped open throats. And only at last did the astounding creature come in focus. There, towering over the weakened scenarios, a magnificent pure white stag, it held the demons at bay. So much did his coat gleam that the minions of the Burning Legion were half-blinded, making them easy prey for the massive animal. Again and again, the stag used his antlers to clear the bloody field before my foes. Nothing, not even Infernals, could slow his efforts. He cleared the Burning Legion, not only from the area of the Fallen Forest Lord, but even from that of the other defenders nearby. With his gaze, the stag told the defenders to drag Sonaris from battle. This they did, even as a new wave of horror charged forwards. Yet, before the stag, nothing long stood. Row upon row of demons rushed up with weapons drawn, only to be torn to shreds moments later. But if the Legion's blades could not bring down this new champion, the Horde had other, more sinister tools at their disposal. From the sky, there abruptly came black lightning, which burned and baked the ground around the stag. In the lightning's wake, erupted dark green fires that scorched the pristine coat of the demigod. Charred earth rose up and formed clawed hands, seized the four legs tight. Then the ranks of the demons parted, and through the ominous gap strode Archimonde himself. Kneel, Archimonde, you will not be allowed further. The, the very soul of Azeroth rises against you. With each step towards the stag, Archimonde swelled in size until he stood as tall as his adversary. In contrast to his many warriors, the demonic commander, he remained stone-faced, almost analytical. He held no weapon, but his clenched fist radiated that same monster's fire that burned around the stag. The demigod shook, breaking away the earthly claws. Then, with a challenging snort, the demigod lowered his antlers and he met the archdemon. Their collision was marked by thunder and a tremor that toppled fighters from some distance around. Demons and night elves alike fled the awesome fury of their duel. Where the stags who struck the harsh ground, sparks flew up into the heavens. Archimonde's own feet dug deep creating ravines and tossing up new hills taller than his warriors. Bloody scars traced the paths of the demon claws in the stag's hide. Sharp, glistening dots from which burst green fire, it showed where antlers had pierced Archimonde's seemingly impervious skin. Demon and demigod wrestled, and no other living creature dared come in their path. Now Cenarius, he was gravely wounded, but the defenders knew that he would live. As they took care of him, as they looked over the wounds, a terrible cry came from the battlefield. As they all turned towards its source, they witnessed Archimonde with one arm around the giant stag's neck, his other hands twisting his foe's muzzle to the side. Already, the stag's head turned at an awful angle, hence the cry. It was already too late. The demon, his expression still indifferent, he tightened his hold further. A tremendous cracking sound echoed through the region. One that for just a brief moment caused all the other noises to cease. And in Archimonde's grip, Cenaris' valiant rescuer fell limp and lifeless. With an almost flagrant attachment, the archdemon tossed aside his adversary, as one might discard a piece of refuse. He then whipped his hands and gazed at the stunned defenders. 
Suddenly, creepy vines rushed up from the other lifeless soil, seizing Archimon's limbs and squeezing tight. Undaunted, Archimon tore off one set of vines, but as he attempted to throw them away, they instead wrapped around his wrist. At the same time, others grew to take the place of those removed. Malfurion's store rage stepped forward, facing the distant demon. A static aura surrounded him, and he constantly muttered over a small leaf similar to those of the vines. Archimon's expression, it never shifted, but his movements became more and more frantic. The vines now covered three quarters of his immense body and appeared all but certain to drape the rest imminently. Perhaps realizing this, the Arch Demon ceased his attempts to remove the strangling plants. Instead, with eyes narrowed, he freed his arms enough to bring his hands together. And as Archimon clasped his fingers, the Legion's terrifying commander vanished in a blaze of green flame. Malfurion felt like he had failed his Shondo when he most shouldn't have. Malorn the White Stag, he came to the rescue of his son paying the price of her own life. Yet all the same, Malfurion was able to force Archimon to retreat, which was no small accomplishment for the student of Scenarius. When the dragons finally did show up, Ysera gazed upon the corpse of the white stag and let out a wail. Not a roar, but a very pitiful wail. She flew where the giant stag lay. The demon still in the area fell victim to her immediate outrage. Ysera snapped up several crushed others and sent the rest flying with a slap of one massive wing. When there was no one else upon which to vent her sorrows, she of the dreaming descended next to the stag and rested her chin upon his broken head. She was Sinar's adoptive mother and held great love for Malorn. Her body shook from what could only be sobs. The other stepped back as she landed next to the unconscious Sinarius. With remarkable delicacy, Ysera took the Forest Lord into her paws. They will suffer such nightmares that whatever they have for heart will explode. I will bring upon them demons of their own who will drive them mad until all they can think about is death. But I will not permit them to wait long enough to achieve it. Ysera was pissed, and with the aid of the dragons, their united efforts were able to reverse the portal created and send the legion back to where they came from. This victory did not come without a great price though. Not only the lives of so many, but their entire world would be changed forever with the sundering of the land. Now in the storm rage, he couldn't really deal with the loss of their well, with their source of power. He knew that the demons had only a taste of Azeroth and would surely come back one day. They would all regret not being ready for it. So with vials taken from the original Well of Eternity, he decided to make a new one. After just having fought a massive war because of the original Well, you might imagine that the Night Elves weren't too happy about his actions. Seeing no other recourse, the Night Elves decided to deal with Illidan once and for all. Ultimately, the decision was made to imprison the Sorcerer. It was Malfurion himself who would see to enacting his punishment. With the help of Scenarius, he chained Illidan deep within a barrow prison, where he would be kept under guard for the rest of his life, which turned out to be quite a long time, as the Night Elves were rewarded by the dragons with immortality. By planting the World Tree Nordrasil over this newly created well, the dragons hoped to contain its power and prevent the Legion or anyone else from abusing its powers. The blessing of the Aspects, it not only gave them immortality, Ysera's blessing, it bound the Night Elf Druids to the Emerald Dream. Prior to this, Malfurion and those that followed his path, they had wandered Ysera's realm, but doing so, it required difficult meditation. The new enchantment placed upon Nordrasil, it would allow these Druids to journey into the Dream whenever they so wished. A great blessing too, as Malfurion would continue to spread the teachings of Ishondo, and the dream, it allowed him to heal the world of his corruption, left behind by the Legion. They would help keep the balance of nature, often working together with Ysera and a green dragonflight, slumbering decades at a time. Yet, the pursuit of druidism, it also pushed them into some territories that should not be crossed, and not even Malfurion was immune to these mistakes. Druids have the ability to embody primal animalistic forms, like the bear form for example, but one form, known as the pack form, was a little bit too wild to control. This transformation, it sent Malfurion so far, that even he turned his fury towards Scenarius. One punch from the Wild God was enough to knock him out, and thankfully, he was able to regain his senses, with the aid of his teacher and the great tree Daronir. This isn't the first time that Scenarius saved him either. When Malfurion walked the Emerald Dream to figure out what was going on at the palace, he encountered protective spells and he tried to undo them. This caused him agonizing pain, and before before he knew it, he found himself in an emerald void, caught within a storm of pure magic. 
the elemental powers threaten to rip his dream form into a thousand pieces and scatter them in every direction, but the Call Scenarius was able to bring him back. When Malfurion faced off against the advisor of Queen Azara for the first time, with advisor known as Xavius, he was able to destroy the Highborn with the mighty power of nature, but their battle, it took place near the portal that they'd been working on, and from deep within, the voice of Sargeras spoke to him. You delay the inevitable. I will devour your world, just as I have so many others. The druid was able to seal off that gateway. Even he knew that it wasn't going to be gone forever, but at least it would bide him some time. If the Lord of the Legion, he would still have him, and he tried to drag his corporal spirit towards him. Tronda was watching over his body, called out to him as the portal slowly but surely closed. He held on to her voice, held on to her image in his mind. Tronda pleaded with Elune to bring him back. Scenarius heard those pleas, both the spoken and the unspoken ones. While he was walking the Emerald Dream, seeking answers to their many terrible questions, he found Malfurion's spirits drifting within the dream. He was very dazed though, and very much confused. He didn't even know himself, let alone Scenarius. But thankfully, the demigod was able to guide his spirit back to his body, and Malfurion would be okay. The same could not be said for Xavius though. His spirit was taken by Sargeras, who decided to give him a second chance to transform him into the first of the Seder and carry out his plans. Xavius would then go about transforming more of the Highborn into beings like himself, was even foolish enough to kidnap Tyrande, something which Malfurion could not appreciate. He used his might to turn the satyr into a freaking tree, an act that will play a massive role later down the storyline, but we'll get to that next week. Now these satyrs that Xavius had transformed, and even pockets of demons, they were still left behind even after shutting down the gateway, after shutting down the well of eternity, and they were such a problem for the night elves that some decided to embrace the pack form and fight back. Despite the Shondo warning them not to go through with it, warning them about the unreliable ferocity that the pack form offers, some of them had so much hatred burning in their hearts for the demons that they decided to do it anyways. They even performed a ritual to try and control the pack form, a ritual that backfired and made it worse. The first of the Worgen were created with the ability to spread the curse to others. As Melfura predicted, not only did they strike out against their enemy, they also slaughtered their former friends and allies. It became such a problem that Malfurion had no choice but to put them to sleep and lock them away within the Emerald Dream. The war and catastrophe, it forced Malfurion to reflect on the state of Druidism. Without some form of regulation, he concluded that some would inevitably go too far in the application of their powers. Malfurion and his followers therefore created the Scenarian Circle, a harmonious order that would guide and keep watch over the world's druids and their practices. They slumbered and learned much of the land, learned much from Scenarius. While time in the real world, it did not stand still. Illidan, the betrayers they now called him, he will be proven right, and the Legion would come back to try and claim Azeroth once again. However, that part of the story we're going to save for next week, as we still have quite a lot to talk about. So for now, thank you very much for watching everyone. If you want more details on all the things that we talked about today, then check out the Leowout article in the description down below. Subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time guys, see ya!